debate government legislation. Uh, it's a it's a really a testament to the repeat failures of the liberal government in actually passing an actual agenda. Uh, Harper, the Harper government has something like 30% more laws passed at this point, and now we're still debating government legislation on like the Accessibility Act, on things like uh, you know some technical changes to the RCMP Act. So we're seeing that the government is now in a rush to pass bills, and so they're having these evening sittings to make up for their failures to actually have a plan in place uh, to address the concerns of Canadians and to deliver on the platform, the platform that they ran on in 2015. Um, before I get too far into answering questions, I just want to make sure I ask you, please share this digital town hall if you're on YouTube or if you're on Facebook. It's a huge help. It really helps out uh, reaching constituents in the writing of Calgary Shepherd, making sure that I reach them and making sure I'm answering questions that are interesting. And so uh, you can also put your questions down either on YouTube or on Facebook. Just write them in the comment section and I hope to get to them uh, during this evening. I always have questions ready to go. People that email me, call the office, or they respond to the email request I, I send out when I ask them, uh, do you have any questions out there? So let's begin. Uh, the first one comes from Eugenia, Christy, Heather, Nancy, and a lot of other constituents who asked this question. Uh, what actions will your government take to build a clean energy economy that respects the Paris Agreement, creates jobs, improves affordability, uh, and respects Indigenous rights? So before I get into answering kind of more substantively, I want to show you a video of uh, our critic on the environment, Ed Fast, uh, asking minister, the Minister of Environment uh, when the government will admit they won't reach their Paris Accords targets and that the Liberals have a tax plan, not a climate plan. Let's roll that video. Well, after taking a beating from the Greens in last week's by-election in BC, the NDP and the Liberals are now desperately trying to one-up each other on climate change, more fear-mongering by the NDP, more empty rhetoric and false information from the Liberals who are desperately trying to distract from their own climate failures. The reality is Canada has fallen way behind in meeting its Paris targets. The Liberals' own emissions report actually shows that. When will the Minister finally admit that her government will not meet its emissions targets? Yeah, yeah. Honourable Minister of Environment. With the member opposite. We brought members of all parties to COP21, including the member opposite. We stood with the world to negotiate an ambi uh, ambitious Paris Agreement. I was extremely proud that we had members of all parties. Then what did we do? We came home and did the hard work. For one year, we negotiated with provinces and territories, Indigenous peoples, with all Canadians to develop a climate plan. But in the face of that, Conservatives continue to deny that climate change is a serious problem, that we are in a climate emergency, that we need to take action. So there you have it. That was the Minister of Environment failing to actually answer the question. But this is the same minister who said in a bar uh, that if you say it loud enough and repeat it, that people will believe you. So she's not interested in actually answering a question. It's always about responding with her. Um, so I share the same concerns that a lot of constituents have, including you, Eugenia, Christy, Heather, uh, Nancy, uh, about making sure that we are good stewards of the environment. And that's the responsibility of every level of government. It's also the responsibility of everyday Canadians. And, and I, I trust Canadians to make the right decisions when it comes to conservation and stewardship of Canada's resources. Now, uh, I'm a conservative. And our leader and the party and myself have all committed to actually putting out the conservative environmental platform at the end of June. It's going to be a fully cost platform. It will be verified by experts who will be able to tell you that we are going to meet our Paris Accords um, aspirational targets as best that we can and without requiring the use of a carbon tax on everyday Canadians because that does not work. It, is a tax plan, it's not an environmental plan. And the only thing the Liberals really have for this is the carbon tax. They haven't really done anything else except to shut down the energy industry, um, uh, force through this fake tanker ban that's now been rejected by the Senate Transportation Committee. That, that bill was called C-48, and it was rejected by the Transportation Committee of the Senate because, frankly, there was no Indigenous consultation. I'll note that in the email you sent me, 
you said that you were concerned about the respect for indigenous rights. And C48 did not respect indigenous rights in any way because there was no consultation done on it, on the, this, this fake tanker ban. So uh, we will be providing a fully costed uh, environmental plan at the end of June that will uh, reach an aspirational uh, Paris Accords targets. Uh, and we'll, we'll have that again, like I said, in about a month's time, because we want to make sure that we have done our homework, that we're proposing something reasonable, that we're proposing something that doesn't uh, micromanage the everyday lives of Canadians. Uh, the next, Joel just uh, asked me the question, my opinion on today's SNC-Lavalin news. So it, for those who haven't heard, SNC-Lavalin today, this morning, a judge has said that they must proceed to court to a full trial on the corruption charges, bribery charges laid against the company. Uh, I think this is good news for the administration of justice. As far as we can tell, the Liberals have not interfered directly in this particular court case, which again, that is good news. And we'll see what the courts decide, we'll see what the prosecution and defense does. Uh, this doesn't mean that the government cannot intervene at some future point with a deferred prosecution agreement, a DPA, that again, you will know, Joel, and other Canadians will know, this is what cost uh, the former Attorney General her job when she said no to the uh, substantive, successive um, interference she experienced from the Prime Minister's office in her decision-making process around whether this company should receive a DPA or not, and her refusal to overrule Kathleen Roussel who is uh, the head of the Public Prosecution's Office. Hopefully that answers to all your question. Um, moving on to Tina. Tina asks me, and, and our others have actually asked me the same question. Uh, she's asking for the government to intervene to protect the threatened boreal woodland caribou. And uh, it's actually a form letter sent by, by others as well. Um, there's a lot of people who have concerns about you know, species like the woodland bore, uh, boreal caribou. Forest management issues and land management issues, though, are the jurisdiction of the provinces. And I know there's a lot of uh, interest out there to see the federal government uh, intervene and uh, inject itself into what is a provincial jurisdiction and to interfere in the administration of forest management agreements and interfere in the land division branches of each provincial government that handle those kind of delicate local decision-making uh, processes. Um, you'll remember that the previous Conservative government in, in put $17.7 billion uh, towards supporting environmental initiatives of different sorts over the time they were there. Uh, they also set aside, uh, uh, they had 1,569 local conservation projects which benefited the habitat for around 430 at-risk species under the Habitat Stewardship Program. I will mention uh, to you and to others, it's always a good idea if you're interested in these types of environmental issues is to look for like a private sector solution through charitable organizations like uh, you know, the, the Nature Conservancy of Canada, CPAWS, and other organizations which do work in the field to try and help uh, both businesses and uh, not-for-profit groups do a better job of land management. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that the best thing to do is to get Ottawa uh, involved in local decision making, telling people what to do and how to do it and micromanaging their lives. It hasn't worked on the fishery side. It will not work on the land management side either. So Tina, uh, that's my answer on that one. Uh, Jason and Dave asked me the question. This is one that's come up in the news lately, but it, it's been discussed before. Uh, they asked me the question, can you taxpayers are now paying to ship trash back from the Philippines? And uh, they're asking me the question, who is the private company that dumped the trash? Why are taxpayers not the unnamed company paying for this? And why is Canada spending in, uh, its global reputation protecting this company? So by spending our global reputation, we losing that political capital, that buying of Canada as a responsible international uh, organization, company, uh, I mean, uh, government. So uh, the waste was sent to the Philippines from a private company, and it was not backed in any way by the Canadian government, and it's not like to find between 2013 and 2014. Uh, that company, Chronic Plastics Inc., and I got a couple of uh, things I'm going to read out to you here, was ba uh, based on the outskirts of Manila, it was formed by another company, uh, Chronic Inc. based in Whitby, Ontario. Now, Chronic Inc. doesn't exist anymore, and so taxpayers now have to bear the brunt of the cost of repatriating this garbage. 
In 2014, the owner of Chronic Inc. denied that his company was shipping garbage overseas. So there's a disagreement there between, uh, I guess, the product that was shipped and then uh, over what actually got there, um, the details of which are not very clear. Um, and according to CNN Philippines, 103 containers holding 2,450 tons of trash were shipped to the Philippines by the same company. Now, the Liberals announced on May 22nd, 2019, that Olore Logistics Canada was awarded a contract to bring the waste back from the Philippines as soon as possible. Uh, and then to prevent further exports of such material, the Canadian government is now amending the export and import of hazardous waste and hazardous recyclable material regulations. And they did that actually in 2016. And amendments now apply to waste that is controlled or prohibited in the country of import, uh, which would mean that the shipment to the Philippines 2013 2014 uh, would be prohibited today. So this can't repeat itself. There's no company that can redo the same thing over again. So that's going to protect future taxpayers. But in order to improve again our um, and protect our relationship with the government of the Philippines, uh, we have to repatriate this garbage. So uh, they have said in the past that um, they, the Philippines will continue to maintain a diminished diplomatic presence in Canada until the garbage is shipped out of their country. And I mean, can you blame them? I, I can't blame them in any way. I think it's a reasonable request of the Filipino government. Uh, to be asking that in this particular case the government of Canada did the right thing, which is to repatriate uh, garbage that was shipped to them uh, under false pretenses, it seems, uh, and even if it's a disagreement between the company, uh, two companies on both sides, it's become a big political issue in the Philippines, and uh, responsibly, uh, we should be looking after uh, our relationship with the Filipino government, we have a lot of trade relationship with them, uh, we lean on them for uh, different uh, uh, trade deals, international agreements, and they are a regional ally of ours as well. So we just got to make sure that we maintain a relationship. So hopefully that answers uh, your question, Jason and Dave, that this will actually uh, further protect Canada's reputation globally. Uh, moving on to the next question, a lot of constituents have asked me this one. It's come in quite a bit, this is probably related to the fact that it's all over American news, uh, CNN and other channels have been covering it. And this one is on the Green New Deal petition. People have been forwarding me emails saying they've signed the Green New Deal petition and they want to know and want to see whether Canada's Conservatives will answer this call and commit to a more ambitious plan to tackle uh, what they call the climate change crisis. And I think i, I got to be very clear here, I, I don't believe there's any uh, uh, major party in Canada that is you know, all in on the Green New Deal. It's not a made in Canada solution. It's not a Canadian based solution at all. This is being pushed by Congresswoman uh, Alexandra Ocasio Cortez, or AOC, as she's known in the United States. Uh, she's a Democrat. The Senator uh, Ed Markey, who's a Massachusetts Democrat, is also supporting it. Um, what the program aims to address is again climate change, income inequality. Um, where in 2019 they would have 100% clean energy, renewable energy by 2030. That's 11 years from now, which I believe is totally unreasonable in any way to get it done. That would mean a shutdown of coal, natural gas, and other types of plants, and a conversion over it would cost billions, if not trillions, of dollars. Um, they're also uh, demanding a carbon tax. I can tell you right there, all the constituents asking me to endorse a carbon tax. I won't be doing so. It's massively opposed by Albertans. It's greatly opposed by Canadians. Uh, carbon tax is simply a tax on everything. And uh, you can, I can guarantee you that Canada's Conservatives will oppose any deal that involves a carbon tax. Uh, and call, this Green New Deal calls for a jobs guarantee, free university, single-payer health care, major focus on public programs, it basically involves a huge amount of new public spending. We've been running $20 billion plus in, in deficits for, for quite a while now. We're supposed to have a billion dollar surplus in 2019, and we don't have one. So, to put it simply, we can't afford any type of Green New Deal. A lot of what it's asking for is backdoor socialism, and we simply can't be seen to be supporting something like it that will not help everyday Canadians in any way. Um, some estimates out there, even Obama's 
former science advisor said it's unrealistic their targets for reaching a clean energy renewable uh, mandate by 2030. Some estimates out there is that cost out the plan anywhere between 51 and 93 trillion dollars. And if I can just put it into perspective, if you add up all the federal government's debt today and you add in the Crown Corporation debt, you have over a trillion dollars of debt. What you're asking here is 50 times more than that spent in the next decade, if not 90 times more on the high end of that scale. It is simply unreasonable to expect the taxpayer of Canada to foot this bill, and there is not enough uh, investment money out there to actually make it happen. So to those constituents who want to support this Green New Deal, we simply cannot afford it. It is not the right solution for Canada. This is an American public debate, and uh, I, I, simply, I don't support uh, drastic, unrealistic, radical changes to our economy that would involve us moving from a free market economy to a command and control economy, which is what the Green New Deal is essentially calling for. Um, I got a question here from Stephen. It's asking, will the Conservatives abolish the CBC or at least the news division? Stephen, I get this question all the time. I, I think it's almost a weekly thing. If someone calls me asking, are we going to abolish uh, the CBC? And even the Liberals are using this line. It's, uh, Andrew Shear has said that he would do so. Uh, that is not the case. In the Conservative Party platform, passed by the membership, debated by the membership of the Conservative Party, it has never been uh, uh, the goal to basically you know, uh, eliminate the CBC as a public broadcaster. As a, as a government broadcaster. What, it's, what our idea is, our policy is, is to divide the operations of the CBC between the editorial arm and their operational arm to add more clarity and greater transparency in what they do. Now, uh, you and I might probably agree about the quality of some of the, the news reporting or what they choose to report on, the words that they use, the quality of the reporting, or the fulsomeness of the facts that they report, but we can't disagree that they do provide a news media function and they, they have journalists who are doing work out there. Like I'll mention to you too is like sometimes I've worked with CBC journalists to try and put a story out there, provide access to information requests I've been working on uh, to show them that the government is hiding information. So uh, the conservatives are not seeking to abolish the CBC. We're seeking to bring more transparency to this crown corporation. And again, a, a more responsible budgeting process is going to ensure that they get a right-sized budget uh, for their needs, for their operations. Um, CBC is also, uh, you know, they, there's Radio Canada, the radio service that they provide to remote communities, but also communities uh, like in Calgary. So uh, uh, hopefully that answers your question right there. I'm the next one I'm going to answer is Mike, because he Mike emailed me on this one, and Mike, I was looking at his uh, email, is actually a um, professional engineer. Mike asked me the question, uh, for the federal government to listen to the unified Alberta legislature on demands for the Senate to turf Bill C-48 and Bill C-69 that will make the approval of large energy and tra transportation projects effectively impossible. So. Uh, to start answering this one, I want to do what I want to do first is I want to play you a video of Shannon Stubbs, who's our energy shadow minister. She's a critic for natural resources energy files from Alberta, from Lakeland region, asking the environment minister to kill Bill C-69. Watch McKenna's answer. Honourable Member for Lakeland. Mr. Speaker, for months, First Nations, trade unions and provinces have warned that the Liberals no more pipelines bill C-69 will block resource development. But yesterday, it got even worse. These Liberals will steamroll provinces, giving themselves unprecedented power over highways, passenger trains, recycling plants, and of course, provincial resources like wind, hydro and oil. Not since the 80s have federal Liberals pit Canadians against each other over resource development and put the whole Canadian economy at risk. Will the rebels kill Bill C-69? The Honourable Minister of Environment. No, we will not kill Bill C-69. The Bill C-69 is in the Senate. I was actually, I was very pleased to testify today to talk about the importance of Bill C-69. Unfortunately, under the previous environmental assessment regime that was brought in by the Conservatives in an ominous budget bill, they gutted environmental 
environmental protections, good projects can't go ahead in a timely way because they all end up in court. We know that we need to have a better system, we have better rules to develop our resources in a way that protects the environment, that does proper consultation and accommodation with Indigenous peoples, ensures that good projects go ahead. We're going to continue to move forward and work with Senators. Honourable Member for so there you have it. Uh, I'm guessing you're just as unimpressed by the answer as I was. Remember, again, this is the minister who said, if you say it loud enough, they will believe it. And uh, hopefully that was loud enough for you. I'm not sure if you believe the answer any more than I did. Uh, the Senate uh, Transportation Committee that looked at the tanker ban bill, C-48, has actually rejected the bill. Um, the Canada's Conservatives, we have been clear from the very first instance that these bills were tabled in Parliament that we would oppose them. They're bad bills. As soon as we work through uh, the structural changes, the mechanics of how they would work, we quickly realized that this was the wrong way to go, that uh, the, the only intent of these bills was to gum up the works and ensure that no new large-scale industrial energy projects we built in Canada. Well, these bills have already succeeded to scare away tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, over a hundred billion dollars in energy investment in Canada. They've destroyed tens of thousands of energy jobs that hardworking middle class Canadians and Albertans rely on. Uh, Bill C-69 has been massively amended by the Senate and will be return hopefully returning to the House of Commons sometime soon so we can look at these amendments. Uh, those amendments at C for C69 were actually passed by the committee itself. And I was there when Premier Jason Kenney and Minister Sonia Savage, the Energy Minister of Alberta, were there presenting a few weeks ago. It was an excellent presentation by our Alberta representatives, making the case that these are terrible, terrible bills that would have a highly destructive effect on our energy industry, on energy workers. So my prof your professional engineer to everyone else, to all my constituents who care about these issues, we are going to continue to oppose C69 in its present form. We continue to oppose it as it is right now. We want to see what amendments will they pass at the Senate floor. I have very low hopes that this will actually be done, that any of these amendments will actually be taken in by the government. They have proven only one thing, that when it comes to balancing the energy and environment, the only thing they're willing to balance is liberal electoral political interests. And everything else is out the window as soon as they're worried about winning their seats and winning elections. Um, it's all about winning for them and obtaining power. It's not about doing the right thing for Canada and doing the right thing for energy workers. Hopefully it answers the question. Uh, JD asked me the question, when Alberta repeals the provincial carbon tax, which is coming in I think a day or two more, we won't have a provincial NDP carbon tax anymore. Will the feds be putting a carbon tax in place in Alberta? JD, I have bad news for you. Uh, there is already a backstop, it's called, a carbon tax backstop that was imposed by the federal liberal government um, as of January 1st, I think, of last year. It's in place, so the day after Alberta gets rid of its carbon tax, you'll have to pay the federal government uh, carbon tax and they have created a system for themselves where they don't have to rebate any of it directly to you. They can create programs and infrastructure spending and then pretend that they have a rebate for you. So the day after Alberta gets rid of the carbon tax, something you, I'm sure, and 55% of voting Albertans decide on April 16th they wanted an end to, uh, it'll be imposed by Justin Trudeau and the Liberal government the day after. So I'm sorry to say that is the case right now. Uh, Andrew Scheer, Conservative government, though, we would get rid of the carbon tax uh, as soon as we got into office, as soon as it was possible to suspend it and then abolish it. Um, the next one is from Daryl. It's an interesting question. Will the TFSA in be increased back to 10500 and perhaps look at reducing the capital gains tax for those of us with zero pension? Daryl, thank you very much for the question. Very technical. I'm going to take those back. I'm going to think about it some more, talk to my colleagues about whether these will be part of our platform in the next election. Um, the TFSA, when it's cut in half, I think it really hurt those Canadians, like you said, who don't have a pension or trying to save for themselves for the future. I think cutting in half was a mistake that the government made. Uh, we should have kept it in place. A lot of young people were using it, even though they were not maximizing entirely its use. Uh, it was still a goal that they wanted to reach. It's, it's a 
tax-free savings tool. I mean, why would you want to tax people's savings? I, I think it was a great idea for Canadians to have a way to save for their own future without having the government nickel and dime them on their own savings. So let me think about it some more, Daryl. Take it back to the Conservative team and see whether we can't uh, uh, maybe think about it some more, consider the consequences, the costs associated with it, and then the underlying implications of doing so. But those are good questions. I thank you very much for them. Greg asked me the question, uh, thanks for doing this. What can we do to stop and reverse the changes in C71? It's a backdoor registry and adds layers of paperwork for legal firearms owners. Greg, I totally agree with you. It's, it's been passed as of today through the Senate. Uh, the only thing we can do right now is the, the same commitment Andrew Scheer made when this law was put, uh, proposed and uh, unamended proceeded through the Senate and then none of the amendments were accepted. Uh, at the different Senate stages is uh, we will repeal this poorly thought out law that doesn't do anything to get gangsters off our streets or get uh, illegal gang used, gang obtained weapons in the, uh, in the conduct of a crime, in, 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 the, uh, in, in criminal activity. Organized crime, gangsters doesn't actually appear a single time in the law. When I spoke to the law, if you go through my Facebook, you'll find a video I did on it as well. If you go through it, um, they, this law will do nothing to stop gangsters from retaining firearms. It'll stop, it won't stop gun crimes in our major cities. It simply doesn't do anything. And you're right, it goes after legal firearms owners. It punishes those people who are already obeying the law. We don't have a problem with firearms owners. We have a problem with people uh, who ignore the law as it is. And th this is organized crime, these are gangsters. What we need is uh, minimum sentencing laws that are reasonable, that judges can apply in a way that gets gangsters off of our streets. Um, that's the way we're gonna solve this problem of gun crimes in Canada. It's not by going after uh, legal firearms owners. Uh, next is uh, from Linda. Linda emailed me this question. For all levels of government, she's asking for it. It's actually a form letter I've received from other constituents. So uh, constituents who send me uh, this form letter, it's, it's about, uh, the subject line is a new future for auto workers. For all, she's asking for all levels of government to intervene and, project, and protect jobs and preserve the manufacturing capacity in the Oshawa GM plant. So for those of us who are from Western Canada and who are not familiar with it, GM, will be keeping the Oshawa plant alive and will be preserving 300 jobs. Uh, there used to be a lot more jobs there, but 300 jobs will be preserved. That's the negotiated agreement with the union. Instead of closing the plant, GM is going to invest $170 million to transform the plant into a supplier of aftermarket parts for existing vehicles. There is no need for government intervention. There's no case for government intervention here. Um, there's a mention in, the, in the, the form letter about using, replacing all of Canada Post 13,000 vehicles with uh, EV vehicles. Now EV vehicles, uh, Canada Post has 13,000 vehicles. Uh, the average age is 9.5 years. EV vehicles, the batteries are no more environmentally friendly than anything else. In fact, their, their supply chain, I would say, is, is not uh, ethically responsible. Like some of the parts in it come from conflict zones, such as the Congo, for bauxite and cobalt. And so these are difficult to obtain materials, uh, to at least obtain ethically. And really, uh, in cases like this, uh, the future of the Oshawa plant is in the hands of GM and the unionized workers who are there right now. There is, a, I don't believe, any role for government to intervene in the negotiations between the employer and the employees. Uh, in this particular case, I, I would be opposed to government intervention, especially a plant, what the, this, this form letter is calling for, Linda, and to my other constituents who, who emailed me on this, it's calling for direct government intervention ownership of a plant to build cars. I don't think the government should be in the business of building autos of any sort. Uh, it's not a line of business we should be getting into. It's not a line of business that the government, I think, would be efficient at. It's also way outside the scope of anything that is in the Constitution, and therefore I would uh, oppose such a move. I want to move on to Karma's question, because Karma has asked me, 
What are the federal seniors' benefits? And she's very specific here. Specifically, benefits including prescriptions, eye care, and ambulance. So, Karma, um, there these are the seniors' programs that you're asking about. There are no benefits for these programs at the federal level. I, I've looked around; I could not find any. Um, there is provision for eye care, ambulances, prescription drugs at the provincial level. So I don't, I don't want to go over too much of it, but I have looked into it. To the best of my knowledge, there is no federal program that covers any of these particular things as part of a health benefit plan of some sort. Um, these will be provided to you by your provincial government. The next question comes to me from Don. Don asks, uh, for the government to help struggling Canadian families and scrap the unfair escalator tax on alcohol. So for those who don't know, on April 1st of every single year, well into the future, um, there's an escalator tax on beer, on wine, spirits, which increases the cost of alcohol for the third time in two years now. And this tax is set to rise every single year without a vote of parliament. Now. Alcohol may just be a, a smaller issue for many, but it tells you a lot about the philosophy of the Liberal government. Wherever they can nickel and dime you and tax you a little bit more, raise taxes on you by stealth, like this escalator, beer, wine, spirits tax, they will do so. So this is a revenue generating machine, and according to Beer Canada, Canadian beer is taxed $20.31 per case on average, compared to $4.12 in the United States. And in 2012, Canada ranked third out of 20 countries for taxing beer. Um, what our leader has said, Andrew Shearer said, is jobs, the economy, and making life more affordable for families are all linked together, and together they are our job number one. Uh, escalator taxes are not, stealth taxes are not, nickel and diming is not. So Don, I can promise you we're gonna take a look at it and we're gonna stop this uh, illegitimate, unjustified fact, practice of hiking your taxes by stealth. The next question comes to me from Dale. So actually the next few is kind of all Health Canada related. So Dale asked a question about vaping products and uh, about uh, what, is, uh, what is my stance on Health Canada's potential regulation on vaping products. This was Bill S5 when it came before the House of Commons. Uh, it was passed on a division vote. It wasn't a recorded vote. Uh, I was opposed to a lot of the provisions in S5 because I thought they treated those who use vaping products um, poorly, like and unfairly. I really didn't think it was very fair to you to be doing that. And uh, in the regulations that are at the consultation stage right now, they're going to prohibit the manufacture and sale of vaping products with certain flavors or flavoring ingredients. Like I, I think if you want to vape bubblegum flavored product, you should be able to do so, especially if it helps you uh, get off smoking cigarettes. Like if that's something you want to do, that's something you think you should be doing, then I'm all for it. Like, and I don't think the government should be uh, the nanny state and all this telling you, well, you may have you know this flavor, but you can't have these other flavors because they could be attractive to you know uh, young kids. I, I think we know that nobody is going to sell uh, uh, vaping products to young kids. It's actually not legal in the law. It's going to restrict and regulate the design features on the boxes, restrict online retail access, restrict product packaging. It, uh, these regulations supposedly will increase transparency. They say openness. Uh, but I want a law that ensures that Canadians who want to use vaping products are treated as adults. And I want you to be treated fairly, which is why I opposed some of the provisions in S5 on vaping products, which was I was opposed to the way it was passing, because I think that if it's reducing harm, which is moving you from smoking cigarettes, and I had constituents tell me this, that, that their vaping products help to get off smoking, then we shouldn't be getting in the way of that. We should be maximizing your choice. And if by maximizing your choice requires us to be a little bit more hands-off on vaping products, I'm all for that. But well, we can do it responsibly without these ridiculous regulations that are telling you how to live your life and what kind of product you can or cannot fake uh, in the comfort of your own home a lot of the time. The next Health Canada question actually came from Brandon. Brandon was asking about the new play in the standardized packaging regulations, uh, which unfairly affects cigar and specialty tobacco markets. 
Uh, it's going to harm small Canadian businesses. Will I appeal to Health Canada to grant an exemption for cigars, specifically tobacco products, from these new regulations? So again, uh, these were embedded in S5. I, I have a couple of points I, I wanted to go through because I've done the research on this just to make sure I could provide you a more fulsome answer. May 23rd, 2018 is when S5 became the law of the land. And that's when a lot of these regulations are being created. On May 1st, 2019, Health Canada released new regulations on tobacco product packaging that are set to take effect in November of 2019. So, Australia, which is a case that's often cited uh, that went into plain packaging, didn't actually drop their smoking rates, uh, which is one of the reasons the government's doing this plain packaging, is they're saying that they're going to uh, uh, reduce uh, people, you know, taking up smoking, and, and you know, as a conservative, and I know a lot of my colleagues share this. We want to make sure that whatever we introduce reduces the illegal tobacco trade. So that's where we should be focusing most of our time on is the illegal tobacco trade that circumvents the excise tax, the rules that we have, uh, where people then don't really know what you're purchasing in these illegal cigarettes, and the market is quite big. Uh, in this field. So 20% uh, of tobacco sold in Canada is from illegal sources and I don't know if illegal packaging will actually make that any better. So I can guarantee you that Canada's Conservatives will look after maximizing the personal freedom of Canadians to make decisions as adults for themselves while protecting children from getting access to cigarettes and ensuring that minors are not taking up smoking uh, until they're, they're age of majority and they decide that's something they want to do, then as adults, we should treat them as adults. But I don't know if plain packaging rules, the way they're being proposed by the government, are exceptionally reasonable or well thought out. Uh, there are defects in how they treat marijuana products, cannabis products, and these new products. Um, they're actually not forcing marijuana products, as far as I know, to have plain packaging, but they will be forcing cigarettes on plain packaging. So there's there's some inconsistencies across the board between vaping products, cannabis products, and uh, small uh, and tobacco smoking products. So I, I think that's important to consider. So Aunt Ron asked me the question here: uh, Will we repeal uh, the Trudeau government's foreign worker program and return the skilled immigration program? So uh, it, it's the temporary foreign worker program it is not the Liberal government's uh, temporary foreign program. That, that the TFW program has existed for decades now. Um, there is already a skilled immigration program. What we've committed to is um, a fair, orderly, and compassionate immigration program. I, I was just at committee today asking the immigration minister, Minister Hussein, and you can actually you scroll down on my Facebook, and hopefully we'll have it up maybe on the YouTube channel soon. If you, uh, if you scroll down go to my Facebook page, you can see me asking Minister Hussein the question repeatedly. Uh, when will you close the loophole in the same third country agreement? There are a lot of problems in immigration right now, solely related to uh, policy decisions made by the Liberals. They're spending well over a billion dollars, $1.1 billion fixing their own mistake, and the backlog continues to grow. So before we address these two other programs you've talked about, we need to change uh, how the immigration department is being administered today. Without doing that, we're only going to keep putting in billions and billions of dollars more. Uh, the parliamentary budget officer, uh, the independent the PBO, said that the average cost is $16,666 per illegal border crosser. That is the average per capita cost to process their claim. Uh, that is an enormous amount of money being spent by your federal government to correct the mistake of the Prime Minister's tweet. That's a very expensive tweet that he put out. So before we address issues in those program, Ron, we're going to have to first start with this legal order process, and I will start with uh, closing the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement and restoring our immigration system to be fair, to be orderly, and to be compassionate. So, and then ask me a question, I like this one because I posted a petition about it. And I got a lot of constituents uh, commenting back and forth on their views, people disagreeing with me, people agreeing with me, uh, people thinking that uh, this particular uh, issue was going beyond the scope of what a government should be doing. So 
And then asking the question that she's concerned that there are not sufficient protections for healthcare professionals with deeply, deeply held ethical beliefs who choose not to participate in euthanasia. It's also called medical assistance in dying. Do I think, do you think, that healthcare professionals that do not want to participate in assisted suicide should be required to refer patients to a practitioner that does? So, a couple of points on this one based on what I've seen from commentary. This is not a religious issue versus a non-religious issue. I don't, religion does not play a part in this. I think this is an issue of ethics, of professional ethics. I think this is an issue of whether we should be forcing public servants uh, to be doing something against their conscience. We make allowances for soldiers who are conscientious, conscientious objectors or pacifists in wartime uh, to take on non-combat roles. Uh, in Alberta, for instance, on the assisted suicide issue, uh, we, I, I've been told we have the best system uh, anywhere in Canada. It's an online referral system where you can easily find information on which doctors want to carry out uh, medical assistance in dying or euthanasia, assisted suicide. I also want to unravel a couple of the things I've seen posted in the comments and a couple of the things I've seen uh, from different groups posting out there. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada, in the Carter decision that they put out, uh, did not say that you had a right to die. What they did say was that there was an exception, an exemption, in the law, in the criminal code provision, on assisting a suicide and exempted medical professionals from being charged. So what they said is, under very strict rules, to be determined by Parliament, so this is wholly within the purview of Parliament to decide that you're, as your representative I was sent here to represent you. For us to decide what that criteria should be. So we passed uh, in Parliament C-14. I opposed it. I tried to amend the bill to make it more reasonable, more logical. It, did not, it does not have conscience protection. I believe that doctors and medical professionals should have conscience protections so that doctors are not forced to uh, assist a suicide when it goes against their personal beliefs, whether they are religious or non-religious. Actually, and in the case of the Court of Appeal of Ontario, brought forward by doctors, specifically those who are secular doctors. They were not doing it for religious reason, reasons, they are just ethically and morally opposed to assisting a suicide. It went, it went against their personal beliefs, all of which these personal beliefs are protected by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So the, the Charter makes an allowance for the protection of your beliefs, freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. These are protected charter rights. These are truly protected charter rights. I want to give you some stats uh, as kind of a, a parting idea, just so we can fill this conversation with facts, and people can you know, put their comments in both the YouTube video and the Facebook page at this point. So, there are at least 2,614 assisted suicide deaths in Canada between January 1st, 2018 and October 31st, 2018. Since the legislative enactment of medical assisted death, there have been 6,749 assisted deaths uh, between December 10th, 2015, which predates the law, and October 31st, 2018. So there were some happening before, and these were maybe uh, differently categorized, which is why there's a difference in the description. So 93% of medically assisted deaths uh, were administered by a physician, 7% by a nurse practitioner. The average age of uh, a person receiving assisted suicide was 72 years old. 64% uh, was for cancer-related reasons, 11% were neurodegenerative, 16% were for cir circulatory respiratory reasons, and 9% were other or unknown. And I have to say that when assisted suicide was requested between January 1st, 2018 and October 31st, 2018, uh, there were 737 inquiries about uh, May or assisted suicide, 407 requests for it, 8 denied requests, which is very, very low, 21 withdrawn requests, 77 deaths prior to the completion of the assessment, and, uh, and that, that's uh, 252 uh, were, were kind of processed at the time. So some of them were still outstanding, I guess, in the processing. Um, so, 
what I want to bring up here is I've actually decided to co-second this bill because I believe that the protection of your rights is the duty of Parliament. Parliament is responsible and is a great protector of your rights. Uh, without Parliament, you wouldn't actually have the Charter and you wouldn't have our 800-year history of common English law protecting things like freedom of conscience, freedom of thought, freedom of belief. Uh, and just because a doctor works in the public sector, because they're paid by provincial healthcare systems, doesn't mean that we should suspend their rights to those uh, charter guaranteed provisions, their charter guaranteed rights. And I strongly believe that they should have protections afforded to them. There is no reason that other provinces can't adopt Alberta's model. Ontario's model requires doctors to do an effective referral. Alberta's model simply requires a doctor to say it's online, you can easily find it on the AHS website. I think that's a far better model. People are very entrepreneurial nowadays. They can have family to find it, find information for them and to help them do this. Um, it's not a question whether it works in your particular case and doesn't work in your particular case. The question is here is what are the provinces doing and how can we ensure that we protect the fundamental rights of Canadians both uh, doctors and nurses who are being asked to provide this, this now publicly provided service in some provinces, and those patients who are requesting it. Uh, and I'll remind you again, the Carter decision did not create a right to die. It created an exemption for doctors, physicians, medical professionals to assist in the suicide. It's right there embedded in the decision. I encourage uh, constituents write it. Annette, thank you for asking the question. I'm glad I could answer it more fully in this way. And agree or disagree with me, I I'm totally okay with that. But on this particular one, I have decided to co-second uh, this particular legislation because I think Parliament is the guarantor of your rights. As uh, Deephan Baker used to say, uh, Parliament is the great protector of the rights of Canadians. Um, Jake Tyler and Jason asked me the question, um, asking whether the government should, would support uh, and ensure that legal, safe, and responsible firearm orders in Canada are not punished by the rumored order in council or cabinet process, firearm, handgun ban, and for the government to address the real causes of gun violence. So to all the, the firearms owners out there, I totally agree with you. Jake Tyler, Jason, all the others who contacted me over the last several while, I, I totally agree with you. Um, C-71, the supposed handgun ban is coming down. We'll do nothing to protect Canadians on our streets. We need to go after those who use them. Uh, gangsters, organized crime. The government has very little to achieve these goals. They, they failed completely to do it. We're gonna repeal C-71. And if they try to introduce this right now, um, we, we'll make sure to uh, well, hold them to account in how they plan to do it. At this point, it's simply a rumor but we will maintain the rights of firearms owners in the current system that we have. It is well regulated. You always need uh, to show ID and your license when purchasing a firearm. Uh, those rules already exist. There are ample rules to protect Canadians. Uh, we need to go after organized crime and we need to go after gangsters. That is the source of our problems and the government's not doing that. It's earmarked $327 million for, for this task and very little, if any of it, that I could track has gone to local police forces to actually implement those, those principles. It's not even C-71 to go after organized crime. The words are not even mentioned in there. But we have a real plan to protect firearms uh, owners and a real plan to protect Canadians, especially in our big cities, which are facing um, ele higher elevated gun crimes, not by legal firearms owners, but by gangsters. And that's the problem that we have today. So hopefully Jake, Tyler, Jason, I answered that question uh, to your satisfaction. We will be there to defend uh, firearms owners. Uh, Linda asked me the question, are refugees required to pay back whatever government benefits they receive within a certain period of time? If so, what if they are unable to? Have there been any studies that show whether the amount of contribute, contributed by immigrants to the economy outweighs the assistance they receive? So, uh, government-assisted refugees receive 12 months of support from the government. And actually, there's a certain way that settlement agencies talk about it. It's actually called uh, the 13th month, when you get completely cut off from federal government assistance. So you get 12 months, and it does not have to be paid back. 
government assisted refugees are those that the government is supporting in a fair um, way and a compassionate way. Whether it's orderly, we can sometimes debate this one, especially right now with all these legal border crossers uh, going across the border. But uh, they are not required to pay back the money. Privately assisted refugees are entire the, the responsibility for their costs for insurance for their housing is entirely borne by the sponsoring agency or by the group of five sponsors it's a it's a, it's a dual system it's very unique to canada uh, privately sponsored refugees you as the taxpayer don't pay a dime government assisted refugees you and i as taxpayers are actually covering the cost for the first 12 months that they are in canada have there been studies that show whether the amount contributed by immigrants to the economy outweighs the assistance they receive? Yes, there's ample studies showing they are absolutely a net benefit. I'm an immigrant to Canada. My wife is an immigrant to Canada. My in-laws, my parents, uh, my neighbors are immigrants to Canada. We are a net benefit to Canadian society. But I encourage you to go and Google find a book by Herb Grubel, who used to be a Reform Party MP from 1993 to 1997, works for the Fraser Institute. The Fraser Institute has a terrific work on immigration, proving that they are a net benefit to Canada. Um, it, it does change over the decades, however, their, their net contribution, you could say. And these are you know, macro statistical uh, data sets that Statistics Canada keeps. But it's a very interesting study that he has out there. You can go take a look at it, but I can tell you as an immigrant myself, I think we have made great contributions to Canada. Uh, just today, we passed, uh, you know, a, a week uh, in remembrance of uh, calling it the National Mennonite Week. Mennonites came to Canada generations ago, and they made great contributions to Canada as well. So, immigrants are net positive to Canada, and uh, I hope that we can continue to having a fair, orderly, compassionate system that continues that well into the future. So, thank you, Linda, for the question. At this point, I want to make sure whoever's joined us at this point, maybe you share this with friends. Please, please, please hit that share button on YouTube. Hit the share button on um, on Facebook. Subs hit the smash that subscribe button on YouTube if you can. Like the video if at all possible. That make sure that yeah, the Facebook algorithms and the algorithms on YouTube raise it up so other constituents can see it. In the writing, uh, this is a digital town hall for me to answer your questions live. And to also answer the correspondence that I received during the week. And I'm always sending out emails asking people to ask me more questions. And I'm trying to give you that, that connection as your representative in Parliament to make sure that I stay connected to issues important to you. So Lillian, and Lillian asked me a very important question here. She's the founder of uh, Canada's Military Moms, or Canadian Military Moms. Um, she's asked a question about the Canadian government's decision to move the Afghanistan War Memorial to a public place and that the government apologized for excluding families of fallen soldiers from the May 13th memorial and hold a new public memorial service. So I have a video here from McCollman and James Bazan. So uh, McCollman, Phil McCollman is our terrific uh, Veterans Affairs Shadow Minister and James Bazan is our defense min uh, Shadow Defense Minister asking uh, Minister of National Defense to publicly apologize for families of veterans. Watch this clip. Floor. The honorable member for Bradford Brand. To secretly dedicate the memorial to our Afghanistan heroes and to exclude the families of the fallen from participating in that ceremony is not only insulting to those who gave their lives. It's cruel to the families and shameful. The Chief of Defence Staff has already done the right thing and apologized, but the Minister of Defence was at the secret ceremony and obviously knew of the details in advance. Why did he approve a secret ceremony for the Afghanistan Memorial? The Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to, to uh, 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 pass on my heartfelt apologies to the families, uh, the families of the fallen, um, as the, the Chief of Defence Staff has already written a letter uh, to all the families. We will make, I've directed the Department to making sure that the, uh, uh, this uh, hall and memorial will be made uh, accessible to all the families and will be done in an appropriate manner, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. We will honour, always honour, the, uh, the families of our fallen. Thank you. So there you have it. That was uh, less than stellar as a performance. Uh, I think the government should be ashamed, and obviously some of their members are ashamed in the performance. 
of their ministers. Uh, after all, many of them were there. Uh, there have been apologies since then. And before I continue, uh, Lillian, I want to say thank you for your son's service to Canada. You wrote to me that he served as a member of the Canadian Forces, two tours of duty in Afghanistan. I just want to say, uh, you know, as a, as a representative of, uh, of the people of Calgary Shepherd, thank you to you both as a, as a military mom, uh, of, a, of a serving member of the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you to your son for his service overseas. I have friends who served overseas as well, who are members of the Canadian Armed Forces, who served in the reserves. Uh, we should appreciate them much more than uh, we do. Uh, we can never repay them enough for being willing to put their lives on the line. It's uh, an absolute appalling insult to families of our fallen who gave their lives in Canada's role in Afghanistan uh, should apologize and they should hold a new public dedication that is in the works right now. They're going to fix their own mistake that they, they should have known that they were making. This is a perfectly avoidable mistake uh, that they should have known about because they were all there and they all went through the ceremony without thinking uh, second thought to all the families who wanted to participate, all the families of the fallen. Uh, who should have been allowed, who should have been actually put at the front, but this is the same Prime Minister who said our veterans are asking for too much. Uh, this is the same Prime Minister who, uh, you know, refused to ensure that pension amounts that they were providing would not leave any veteran behind, and that's not been the case since then. This is a giant slap to the face. He needs to apologize. We saw, again, today we asked the Prime Minister questions whether he would personally apologize to the families, and he actually refused to do so. So uh, to the families of the 158 Canadians killed in Afghanistan, you have my thanks for your service. Uh, I am ashamed that the government did not include any of you in the, the rededication of the Afghanistan War Memorial, and I'm hoping they will fix this mistake and truthfully apologize and keep apologizing to you, because that's the right thing to do. John asks me the next question. Uh, John actually had a longer email asking for the government to continue and increase funding to the CBC. So John, I'm gonna disagree with you. There's a bunch of points that you wrote in it. Um, I actually went through it. Uh, I found a Friends of Canadian Broadcasting kind of metrics over the funding over the last few years. As you know, the Liberal government has, um, uh, the government has kind of restored uh, a bunch of the funding that was cut in the Cartagena years. They've increased funding. I disagree, though, that the business model of uh, American broadcasters or private broadcasters is toxic. That's the way you defined it. American channels are providing uh, you know, content that Canadians want to read. They are um, you know, providing information that Canadians want over the airwaves, over Netflix, over Crave TV, whatever that content is. And oftentimes these foreign sources of news, of comedy, of drama, uh, also have Canadian actors in them. Like they're, you know, the actor that after all that played Deadpool uh, was Canadian, is a Canadian. And it, it, I think it, it, we can't be calling them toxic. I, I, you know, I like some CBC shows, like uh, I'll tell you that the, I, I greatly like Kim's Convenience, and uh, I, I watch Working Moms. I, I think both shows are good, but it doesn't require more funding to the CBC. There is an entire breadth of amazing content out there from private sources, everyday Canadians, everyday people making content for you to watch on YouTube, on Netflix, on Disney's new service they're gonna be providing, on Hulu, on, on a whole bunch of different sources, on Amazon, you don't need the government doing it for you with your own taxpayer dollars. And you don't need the government taxing you to finance these operations at the CBC. The CBC has more than enough money to do this right now. Um, it will not increase choice, so I disagree with you there. I know that that's probably not the way that uh, uh, an MP should be doing things, but uh, I, 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 I can agree with uh, your point that we're throwing billions at Silicon Valley monopolies. I actually couldn't find any billions that we've thrown at them. And you say that they pollute our democracy and Americanize our screens. I, I would disagree with you there. There is more American news in our networks than there used to be. And uh, that we let them play by their own rules and subsidize them with tax dollars worth more than double what's invested in the CBC. And again, I'm gonna disagree with you there because we don't subsidize them. 
not in any way that I would recognize as a subsidy. So Chris, we're going to have to agree to disagree. Uh, Marianne asked me the next question. I like this one. What is your stance on the new regulations that you will obstruct uh, that you will obstruct the entry of new medicines to Canada? Uh, and will you urge the federal government not to move forward on these proposed changes? So I'm not obstructing the entry of new drugs into Canada. What you're referring to you is the PNPRB changes that uh, that the federal government is trying to move on, which is the Patent Medicine Patient, uh, Patient Review Board. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, Prices Review. This is the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board. It's a very long acronym. Uh, this is a board that looks on the pricing of trademark medication. Uh, I believe this is a mistake by the government, the way they proceeded with making the changes. It's very unclear of what they're trying to achieve. If they think that simply uh, changing the basket of countries about where you set your prices is enough, uh, it, it is not enough. What we should be looking at is what do patients need, where can we maximize the access to drugs, and then reimbursement by public insurers. And I will always be on the side of rare disease patients. You provided me a letter from the Canadian Organization for Rare Diseases. I was just at a panel um, on Monday and their, their CEO and President Durhan Wong uh, was there and she you know, presented her case very well. I spoke to her, it's actually Durhan Wong Rieger and uh, uh, Dr. Durhan Wong Rieger uh, did an excellent presentation on some of these changes that are going to be done. Uh, I'm the member of Parliament who hosted Rare Disease Day on Parliament Hill. I introduced amendments to the disability tax credit to make it easier for uh, patients with rare diseases to obtain and have a write-off of their medication uh, on the medical expenses tax credit. I will always be on the side of patients obtaining access to the drugs that they need and making sure that we have a vibrant system that ensures patient access with patients first. Uh, they cannot be seen as simply a cost. You pay taxes for the system and you're not given a lot of choice in other places to go to. So what I don't want to see is government uh, interfering in a system that, uh, although not perfect, uh, has achieved some of the goals of providing access. But they should be, we should always be careful to ensure that we don't limit access to the latest, greatest drugs in the market that will make the lives of Canadians uh, with rare diseases, rare disorders, better. And I think it's really important. Uh, I'm going to move on to Deirdre's uh, next question because it's about 5G. So, the federal government is responsible for the role of the 5G technology. Will the federal government do any studies on the negative health? and environmental effects of the millimeter waves that 5G uses. There are also serious privacy and security concerns, especially since Huawei is involved. Will the federal government do its due diligence to protect Canadians? I have a clip I want to show you of our Shadow Minister Dan Alves asking the Prime Minister if he'll listen to CSIS and ban Huawei. Honourable Member for Central Okanagan's Milkman Nicola. Mr. Speaker, our allies have spoken, security experts have spoken, now the head of CSIS has spoken. As one of our country's top security officials, he said publicly that, that hostile states are targeting our 5G network. Communist Chinese laws are clear. Companies in China must, and I quote, support, cooperate with, and collaborate in national intelligence work, end quote. Huawei will be forced to spy on Canada. Will the Prime Minister commit to ensuring our next generation network is secure and ban Huawei? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this government takes very seriously the safety and protection of Canadians, including in cybersecurity and uh, uh, in all related matters. That is why we work with the extraordinary professionals in, professionals in our security and intelligence services uh, to determine the best way to move forward in growing the Canadian economy, creating uh, new technological innovations, and keeping uh, our country and its infrastructures safe from foreign interference. Uh, that is the task that our uh, uh, security Security and intelligence agencies do extraordinarily well, and we always support them and accept their recommendations. Honourable Member. So, if that wasn't worth salad to you, I, I'm not sure what it would be, but I would call it baffle gap as well. Um, we're committed to banning uh, and barring Huawei from operating areas where they could be they could put the privacy and safety of Canadians at risk. Australia, uh, New Zealand and uh, many of our other allies like America have banned Huawei from the 5G network. The problem isn't so much with Huawei's devices, the handheld devices, it's with their network devices 
and the possible backdoors that the People's Republic of China's government could use to enter into our networks and access the information of Canadians, but also access governmental information or private corporation for industrial and government espionage. The issue is not the company necessarily, it's the laws passed in the People's Republic of China that require companies like Huawei to comply with the national security and spying operations of their government. That is a huge area of concern, and that is a problem very unique to the People's Republic of China. They have a terrible human rights record. It should, be, it should come as no surprise that, that they should be barred from entry into the 5G network. Now, as far as the health concerns go, I can't answer that. I could not find any uh, you know, broad-based academic study looking at the effects of 5G. I can almost guarantee, though, that companies would not be putting it out there if there were health effects, because they'd be probably worried about lawsuits and about spending billions of dollars on a rollout of technology that could put the health of people at risk if they would have to then cancel and roll it back. So I uh, could not find anything, can't answer the first part of the question, I'm happy to answer the second part, which is Huawei uh, should be banned from operating uh, in sections of Canada where there are privacy concerns, where the network devices could be put to use by uh, the People's Republic of China. We've seen how they treated Canadians. They've banned canola imports, they, they, can canola imports. they have gone after soybeans, pork, uh, they have detained uh, two Canadians, and they've put them on trial. The, our relationship with that country right now, the People's Republic of China, is frosty at best, and that is entirely the fault of the Liberal government. So I want to move on to my last question I'm going to take here. So if you have any other questions, feel free. Put them in the comments on YouTube or on Facebook. If you haven't done it yet, please uh, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, hit that like button, share the video over Facebook if you possibly can, type in the name of a, of a co-worker, of a family member, of a friend, just to add it in there so they can watch the video if they have similar questions that I've answered tonight. Uh, so Risa or Risa, hopefully I've, uh, I've said the name correctly, the digital media bailout that Trudeau has implemented is against free speech and independent journalism. Can you not stop this media censorship? It's a great question. It's one we've asked repeatedly. We actually have members of the conservative team. Gerard Deltel is a former journalist. Peter Kent is a former journalist. Uh, Jamie Schmale, who sits right behind us, is a former radio journalist. Uh, so the, we have journalists in our caucus already who have said time and again, and we've heard this at, at the committee, at the Finance Committee, there are serious problems with the way the government has set up this tax credit and who will gain access to uh, this media bailout. So the government's uh, biggest mistake has been to put Unifor. Unifor, which is a public, which is sorry, it, it's a union whose boss, Jerry Diaz, has said that he and his workers are the resistance to Canada's conservatives, to Andrew Scheer, uh, blowing away any notion that this is uh, uh, an independent, nonpartisan exercise. Uh, this is an absolutely ridiculous thing. Uh, Unifor should be kicked off this panel if uh, the Prime Minister and the Liberal government hopes to claim that this is actually an independent, non-partisan exercise to support uh, Canadian uh, publishing. Uh, there's very few companies who will be eligible for it, and we ask them the question at committee, you know, magazines like Shackland will not be allowed, claims won't be allowed, a bunch of other ones won't be allowed already. Uh, you know, small independent journalism like Black Box here in, in, in Ottawa will probably not be allowed. They don't want subsidies anyway, so um, we can't stop it at this point. But I can promise you that on October uh, 21st, should we earn the right to govern from Canadians, uh, we will eliminate the media bailout entirely. Thank you very much all for joining me tonight. Thank you very much for joining this town hall. Uh, thank you for listening again. I hope this format works for you. If you've got more questions, email me, call my office, put a comment on YouTube, put a, put a comment uh, down on Facebook, and we'll do this again next time I'm here in Parliament on a Wednesday, every Wednesday, Digital Town Hall. Thank you very much for listening. Have a very good night. Thank you.